Mary Ellen's our host. Good to see you all. Uh, usually we have a couple of people coming in at the last minute. We're going to begin with some verbal prayers, which sometimes in uh, in teachings when the Dalai Lama and other lamas give teachings, that's all that's said. But sometimes, uh, depending on the the Lama, there's a great motivation that's that is presented afterwards, and that's what we like to do. So we're going to start with uh, taking refuge in generating bodhicitta and offering mandala. Sange churang soki chugnam la Changchu badu dagni kepsu chi Dagi chunyen gi pe sognam ki Rola penji sange drupa sho. I go for refuge until I am enlightened. This is a special kind of refuge, Mahayana refuge. Usually, refuge in the Hinayana is just in one for this lifetime. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly, meaning the Arya Bodhisattvas, through the collections I create, through listening to the Dharma, may I become a Buddha in order to benefit all wandering beings, all drova, or all migrating beings. Sange chodang soki chodnam la Changchu badu dagni kapsu chi, dagi chunen gi pe sognam ki, dola penche sange drupa sho. By offering this ground, anointed with perfume and strewn with flowers, adorned with Mount Meru, the four continents, the sun and moon, visualized as a Buddha realm. So that means you, your first visualization is of this uh, whole realm that we live in, let's say, uh, with our sun and moon, our uh, world system, the southern continent that we're on and the other continents and so forth. And then you transform that uh, into visualizing it as a Buddha realm due to that May all migrators, may all wanderers enjoy such a pure realm. And then offering to our primordial guru, O holy and perfect pure Lama, from the clouds of compassion that form in the skies of your Dharmakaya wisdom, please release, please send down a rain of vast and profound Dharma, precisely in accordance with the needs of those to be trained. Idam Guru Radna Mandala Kam Okay. So good to see you. See some a couple of new people. Uh, hi. Yes, yeah, she's been here before. Jennifer's here. Mintu Anna Snehi and Yujit Jung. Is this your first time where you've been before? Yes, it is my first time. You did. Okay. You did. Mm -hmm. Oh, so like like Judith, but Judith. Mm -hmm. So good to see you. Um, so we're going to begin with a little meditation to calm our minds, to try to stop the continuity of the uh, background thoughts, conceptualization in, in our minds. And then we're going to meditate a little bit uh, to try to set a motivation, a bodhicitta motivation. So sit comfortably. Relax your body. Relax your mind. I've been monitoring my blood pressure these days. So when I meditate, when I monitor my blood pressure, I try to try to do this also just to sort of for worldly reason, just to calm the the body and mind. Recognize your breathing. Once you once it's recognized as inhalation and exhalation, place your mindfulness on it to the exclusion of other thoughts.
even though some of you may have only counted, if you were counting, seven respirations or so. We're going to now turn our attention to a more subtle object than respiration to the conventional nature of the mental consciousness. which we first recognize through just looking at the contents of the mind, the thoughts, future-oriented plans. Past-oriented memories. Present-oriented various observations about the present thoughts that arise due to karma, continuity of thoughts that you've had, all of these like clouds in the otherwise clear light state of our mind. Trying to see the clarity between the thoughts until they begin to subside and you're left and just say, clear non-conceptual state, non-conceptualizing state. And recognizing its conventional nature as being non-obstructive to the entry of thoughts or to their reabsorption back into the consciousness. whatever appears to your mind, letting go of it. And again, abiding in that subtle object, which is just the mere negation of any obstruction to the arisal or, or reabsorption of thoughts into the mind. conventional clear light in nature. Which hopefully we can mm, have simultaneously with a pleasant mental experience, happy thought, happy mind. That this means that we can develop all of the good qualities and eliminate all of the faults this is called, also called our conventional Buddha nature, the developmental Buddha nature. That means that we can develop, there's no hindrance in our mind to developing virtuous qualities. There's no hindrance in our mind to eliminating all those faults that we thought were just, that's who I am. I'm an angry person. I'm a this or that, we can get rid of all of those. And the fact that we can recognize that right now is due to the fact that we have this auspicious moment of a life of leisure and endowment that the Buddha praised in so many sutras. We have a life, a human life without the major hindrances to practicing the Dharma. Of course, being a human, we're not born in the in the lower realms. We're not born in the light in the realms of the long life gods, all of which are hindrances to practicing the Dharma. Unfree states, they're called. And even as a human, we're born in a place where the there's freedom to practice religion for most of us, if not all of us. The Buddha has turned the wheel of Dharma in this universe. Those teachings still are alive and realized. There are spiritual aspirants like ourselves, Sangha, existing that we could join if we want. 
there are benefactors. And we're not born in a, in a country where there is, uh, what do you say, a barbarian country where the tendency is to uh, shun religion. We have all of the necessary factors to practice the Dharma, which means to, in the very minimal sense, not to be overcome with the appearances of this life, the gain and loss, the happiness, unhappiness, the power, wealth, and so forth, but to be working in such a way to create virtuous karma for the happiness of future lives as at a minimum a person of lowest spiritual scope. Or we can work to escape from cyclic existence as a person of intermediate scope. But as the Buddha had advised us in the Mahayana Sutras not to be satisfied with his lesser vehicle, with his Hinayana that he did teach. But if we have intelligence and interest to enter into his great vehicle, the Mahayana, even before understanding compassion for other beings, just to think this is the advice of the Buddha, it's so rare to enter into the Mahayana, to develop bodhicitta. And then to understand the reason for doing that is that bodhicitta is a mind that observes sentient beings who are suffering, wants to free them from suffering, and takes aim, takes as its aim the achievement of Samyak Sambodhi, fully enlightened state, not just the, the state of nirvana, to be able to affect that, having a continuity of three Buddha bodies, the Dharmakaya, Nirmanakaya, and Sambhogakaya, to teach <clears throat> sentient beings to lift them out of suffering without error spontaneously, effortlessly, place them in whatever time it takes, numberless lifetimes, in some cases, into the state of enlightenment. Because all sentient beings have been kind, numberless times, depthlessly kind, when they've been our mothers, again and again in the past. And even when they haven't been mothers or friends, even when they've been just neutral strangers or even enemies. They've benefited us in myriad ways. They're exactly equal to us in wanting to be free of suffering, wanting to be happy. So to develop that thought of Buddhicitta, wanting to achieve enlightenment for the sake of sentient beings, should be our motivation. In order to do that, to affect that, we need to accumulate the causes of Buddhahood. That's our goal, to achieve Buddhahood for the sake of sentient beings. The, the main causes are the collection of merit and the collection of wisdom, which are explained in Nargajuna's fundamental wisdom, Chandrakirti's commentary on that, the Majamaka Vatara, and Lama Tsongkhapa's commentary to both of those the Gombarapso that we're studying that explain the methods how to how to accumulate merit, how to accumulate the collection of wisdom. So think I'm going to participate today listening, hearing the teachings, developing the wisdom of hearing, contemplating that it means analyzing the words to get a deeper meaning of that. And when we've come to develop the wisdom of contemplation, and when we've come to certainty about certain aspects, 
to hold our mind momentarily, single-pointedly on that certainty to develop the wisdom of meditation. I'm going to participate today in order to become enlightened, to, be able to become a Guru Buddha for the sake of all sentient beings. Okay. So, how are we doing? Okay, we have a big, nice, big crowd today. <laughs> Good to see you all. Um, so before we begin, are there any questions? Someone at Tibet House in the U.S. is here also. Who is that, do you think? Is that John? Oh, John, okay. Because you're a you're using their Wi-Fi system at Tibet House. Huh? <laughs> so anyone have any uh, any questions from the previous classes or general Dharma questions that have been plaguing you? Judith, anything? U Judith is new member joining us today, testing us out, seeing if it's sensible to waste her Saturday afternoons. You're, you're muted, Judith, so we can't hear you. You have to- I, I know, I tried to find- There you go, there you go. To Unmute. Yes, I'm new. I just moved here. A friend, um, <clears throat> Sne Patel, introduced me to the Shantideva Center. And ah, good. I'm part of the Drepung Los Ling Monastery in Atlanta. Uh, excellent, excellent. So are you down in Atlanta? Is that where you live or are you in New York? I just moved to New York. Okay. Okay. Good luck with that. Thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm teasing. Okay. So uh, Mikhail has a question, I think, he has his hand up, virtual hand. Thank you, Verna. Um, yeah. Um, uh, in the paragraph we, we just ended with uh, last week, Right. Um, it is said that uh, we do not perceive seed and sprout as being not distinct. <laughs> the realities of these two cannot be identical in all aspects. All right. Aspects. right. So when I hear that, that they are not identical in all respects, and he, uh, Tsongkhapa uses this, this uh, phrase uh, a few times before, it sounds like he's refuting refuting intrinsic sameness. No, I, I don't think so. I, I don't think I don't think it goes that far as he's refuting uh, just on the conventional level that you can see that they're not the same. Uh, the uh, when when he's translating, Jim is translating reality. I think it's it, Mopo here. Um, yeah, I have one more argument about this, <laughs> if you may. Yeah, yeah, go on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I just, let, just let me finish that. So, so what he's talking about is that you can see, for instance, the seed has a different shape and color than the sprout. So the, the uh, Samkhya position that they're in, in nature, they're the same in all ways, is, uh, is kind of uh, being contradicted here. Yeah, so they, have, they, 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 they argue differently to try to get out of that, but that's 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 a, that's the case. So continue. Yeah, uh, uh, um, because the thing is, um, just the, six, the page after, we have a new uh, another section about this self arising, and and it's uh, uh, self arising. Um, there is no self arising even on the conventional level. Oh, you mean a couple of sections after this? Yeah, just the page, the next page. Refuting the concept. Demonstrating that there is no self arising, even on the conventional level. Right. And to me, that sounds like 
well, we, we just refuted intrinsic self-arising. Now we it's also true conventionally. Well, let's wait till we get there. That's still a couple of sections. There's still a couple of sections beyond. Well, let's wait till we see that. Uh, someone else had a question. I can't remember who had their virtual hand up. There we go. Yeshi. Yes. Um. You, you know, sorry of my ignorance and like uh, not understanding things going on, but um, my like last few weeks, I kind of sort of followed how, um, you know, the nature in the seed is not transferred to the seedling. And so, so like a, the, um, like a logic of um, those uh, self-existing nature does not exist. I understand that for the example of a seed and seedling, but how can it be universally applied, like uh, logically? What, what if uh, there's uh, something that like uh, intrinsic nature exists, you know, for the seed growing up to the seedling, that part, like that example, that only that example, I understand what they are saying, but um, how can that one example can be applied to everything? Like, like for example, if, you, um, you know, I cannot remember her name, I remember her face, but um, the lady from India, she was keep talking about proton and electron and neutrons right, right, right. But, but what if, what if the like um like a galaxy dust exists what is by, it what by natural name. Say, say again what is what 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 if um like um like like you know space dust like or just uh co like a uh, come to existence by itself and we don't just see it i mean right. why, what if there's uh, something that okay like, so let, let's let's get straight what we're talking about here yes so we're talking about the Samkhya Vedic school, right? Right. Her position uh, of a self arisal or right. self birth, you could say, in 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 uh, yeah, to Jibba's translated self arising, arising from oneself. So the the, the sprout. Uh, any kind of effect uh, existed previously in its cause. So that would mean that the, the, the nature of the sprout existed in the seed, which was its cause before the sprout ar arose, right? Right. So my thing is, um, you know, if something... Like, like, like if you put a logical statement, I think it have to be applied to anything and everything in the universe no no because <laughs> it's not talking about everything first of all this is only talking about impermanent phenomena because only impermanent phenomena have arisal or birth or uh generation right uh production you don't you don't have production of permanent phenomena so although you might say oh i, I knew that but that's you can't say this. This is an argument that's referring to everything. There are other logical arguments that refute um, the the true the inherent existence of uh, permanent phenomena. But here we're only dealing here we're dealing with these four positions of production. If something that's impermanent has to be produced, every every moment of it is is a product of its causes and conditions and there are only four ways that something can be produced from its from something which was itself already there before something which was different it's like the seed that was of a different nature something that's both the same and different and and or arising uh being produced without any causes uh those are the only four positions so here we're just dealing with the first position Okay. which is espoused by the Samkhya school, that that impermanent phenomena like sprouts and seeds, the, the sprouts, uh, in this case, as an example, there are other examples that are used, it arises from a seed which is of the same, that it, it, the seed within which there is already the nature of the coming sprout. That's the, that's the, situation we're talking about okay thank you for the clarification <laughs> yeah i'm not sure if it clarified but uh 
just so we know where we are. Okay, so uh, how are we doing? Anyone have a, a, another question? Okay, so we are, we stopped last time and we're, I said we would start here and, and in Jippa's text, if you have the written text, it's page 201, the FPMT translation. Uh, Judith, I don't know if you know, there's a, a PDF you can get of the translation that was made uh, sort of earlier when we were at a certain point, we, we had Jimpa's translation and Jeffrey Hopkins translation of the first five Bumis. And then later we had Jimpa's translation. We compared with, um, who is it? Anne Klein's and Jeffrey Hopkins translation of the first verses of the sixth Bumi. Uh, now we have uh, Jimpa's translation comparing with the FPMT version by Venerable Joan Nicell. So you can download that free of charge. You can get that PDF and you can compare it with Jimpa's text. So if somebody can put it into the chat, I would appreciate that. Oh, so, yeah. If someone, if uh, maybe. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll put a link to the Dropbox because you can't, I don't think you can put PDF in, but I'll either put the PDF in or I'll put a Dropbox in. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So Judith can download that now, but um, I think most other people have that. So um, so in the FPMT, it will be page 106. That's where we're about to start. But just to, just to um, go back one paragraph, because as Mikhail had pointed out, there was some sort of uncertainty here. So just before that, uh, it says in Jimpa's translation, Given all these undesired consequences, uh, so the consequences of there are uh, other flaws, Chandrakirti was saying, and Lama Sokapa's commentary says, there are other floor, flaws as well. For you, Samkhya, this is reading the paragraph before that, uh, then there cannot exist a sprout distinct from the seed that causes it in shape, uh, in color, in taste, and potency and ripened effects, in shapes such as long and short, color green and yellow, so on, tastes like sweet, sour, and so on, potency and ripened effects. This is this is this is putting a consequence to the samkhyas. Uh, say it, it, you, you could say it follows that there cannot exist a sprout. Uh, distinct from the seed that causes it with a different, you, you, you can't have a, a sprout that's of a different shape than the seed, a different color, different taste, uh, potency, and ripened effect. This is because you make no distinction at all between the reality or nature of the seed and that of the sprout. So that's that Samkhya basic assumption that they they have the same nature or reality. Then uh, this is the paragraph that uh, uh, Mikhail was talking about just before we started. Given all these undesired consequences, that those are the undesired consequences, uh, and furthermore, given that we do not perceive them as being not distinct, so there's like a double negative, right? We do not perceive them as being not distinct. That means we do perceive them as being distinct. We do we do perceive the seed and the sprout as being different, right? Given that, um, a sprout and a seed cannot be identical in all respects, in all aspects. In this way, and the uh, Jimp is adding some extra words here, although he doesn't put it in parentheses. It is not doesn't mention Chandra Kurdi in the Tibetan text. Lama Somkapa is not saying that. In but Jimpa translates in this way, Chandra Kurdi throws to his Samkhya opponent. You could put Chandra Kurdi also in in parentheses. You could say, in this way, uh the the reverse of the consequence is thrown. 
so uh, let's see. The Tibetan phrase here is Lokpa Pempa Zete. That's all it says. Lokpa Pempa. Pempa means to throw or to imply. Uh, Lokpa means reverse. So it, it, the, the text doesn't say the reverse of the consequence. It just says uh, the, a reversal is thrown. So what that means is that, um, yeah, this this kind of terminology, this is what we're going to be talking about a little bit. Yeah, let me just read the rest of the paragraph. There is, however, a great difference between throwing the reverse of the consequence and throwing the reverse of a consequence that contains an autonomous syllogism. The, the, the Tibetan, again, doesn't mention consequence. It just says, Lokpa Pempa Dang, Lokpa Rangyu Pempa La, Kepa Shintu Chewa. There's a great difference between uh, throwing a reversal and throwing an autonomous reversal. So that's what we're trying to get our minds about. What's, what is this talking about? So this is talking about the um, sort of the sort of the origin of this kind of uh, you know, terminology is this uh, situation where Bhavada the Veka, the famous Majamaka, criticized Buddha Palita's uh, commentary on fundamental wisdom. Buddha Palita was usually we consider to be the, the uh, originator of the Prasangika school because he's the first one who pointed these out. Chandrakirti was a little bit later. So Bhava Viveka criticized Buddha Palita and in so doing, uh, they came up with these uh, questions about uh, they they both agreed Buddha Palita and, and Bhava Viveka both agreed that in some cases in dealing with the Samkhyas or some other people that you have to use a consequence you can't you can't state to them a syllogism remember the difference between a syllogism and a consequence right a syllogism is a logical statement that has to have that has a subject, a predicate, and a sign. Technically, also has to have an example, but we're not talking about the examples here. Uh, it, it has to have the property of the subject. That means the subject has to be the sign. In a in the syllogism, sound is impermanent because it's a product. That would mean that sound has to be a product because product is the sign or reason. It also has to have the forward pervasion that whatever is a product is necessarily impermanent. That's true. It also has to have the reverse pervasion. Whatever is, uh, so what, what is the reverse pervasion? Samkhya. Uh, Samkhya. <laughs> Sankhya. What's the reverse pervasion? I changed my name, see? I'm now a Sankhya. I'm still calling you Sankhya, yeah. What's the reverse pervasion? Then? Well, the reverse would be that the whatever's a, the reason is also something that's anything that's the, or everything that can be, is classified in the reason is also classified as in the product. That's not the reverse pervasion, no. Well, the reverse. So, whatever is the product would would also have to be impermanent. Isn't that the reverse, or is it the other way around? The the actual forward provision is whatever is the reason is necessarily. The oh, product. okay. I had it reversed. The okay, reverse okay. provision. Yeah. Okay. Even Stephen, do you know? Whatever is not impermanent is necessarily not a product. product. 
product, right? So that's, but uh, but in the logical system, it, it's explained that if you if you can prove the if you have the forward pervasion, uh, you don't have to prove the reverse pervasion. But sometimes you you use the reverse pervasion. So that when we're talking about reverse, that's what's talking about the opposite of something. So. Um, what one can do uh, if you cannot pr if you cannot uh, present the the syllogism to someone who's holding, for instance, the sound is permanent, you can't present to them the syllogism sound is impermanent because it's a product, because their mind is like you know rigid uh, and not and not interested in proving that sound is impermanent. That's one of the factors that has to be necessary uh, to in classifying a correct syllogism, a correct logical argument. The person you're presenting it to has to be interested in finding out whether, in this case, say sound is impermanent. But to a Samkhya, they're not interested in in finding that out. They believe unequivocally that sound is permanent. Okay. So what you have to do then is you have to uh, to shake their confidence. You have to provide them with a uh, reversed a reversal of that syllogism. So when you reverse the syllogism, you end up with a consequence. If you reverse the consequence, you end up with a syllogism. You can have a reversal of both ways. But here we're starting with the syllogism. Sound is impermanent because it's a product. So you would present to them, sound is not a product because it's permanent, All right? Everyone's been, we, we talked about this before, so maybe you have to do some mental gym, gymnastics. Um, so it follows that, That's the, that means it's a consequence. It follows that sound is not a product because it's permanent. So the, the person you're talking to, you're presenting to this, whether they be Samkhya or some other of the Vedic schools that hold that sound is permanent. Uh, sound is not a product because it's permanent. They would agree with the, the sign. Yeah, sound is permanent, but they they have some doubt because they, they do believe that sound is a product of causes and conditions. You know, Generally, when you pointed out to them that sound is created uh, in general, it can be the product of causes and conditions that maybe they get a little bit confused because they're holding the sound is permanent. Uh, but it, it is uh, so they're uncertain about that predicate. Sound is not a product. In fact, sound is a product. So you couldn't present that as a syllogism to them. You couldn't say sound is not a product because it's impermanent. Why couldn't you do that, Paul? Uh, because that would uh, that would entail using an autonomous syllogism. Uh, wouldn't they, would even if you're not talking about autonomous sy syllogism, just just using without talking about it it couldn't be a syllogism because it doesn't have uh the mm, well sound is sound is a product sound is not a product because it's permanent it's that it's not a correct syllogism because mm, it mm. doesn't have the property of the subject first right, of all right right sure. sound is not permanent and so right. that's why you have to that's why you have to phrase it as a consequence to right. right okay okay so that's where that's where that's kind of the situation that we're talking about here uh, now, yes go on so, so just to be sure um, uh, um, um, I'm understanding correctly sorry um yeah. the, 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 the the only difference between consequence and syllogism is about whether the one who states it, uh, is okay with the three mode. I mean, if you, if, if it cannot, it can be a syllogism only if the one who says it, uh, um, 
accepts the three modes of the syllogism, if it's the correct one. Yeah, yeah. A, a correct syllogism has to have the three modes. Yeah. So the terminology here, modes, in Tibetan we say sul, sul sum, there have to be three modes. That means the property of the subject, the forward pervasion, and the reverse pervasion. A, a, a correct syllogism has to have the three modes, uh, that those three factors. Uh, whereas a consequence does not have to have them. Yeah. You can just throw abs absurd consequences to someone that don't have that statements that don't have the three modes. So for instance, sound, it follows that sound is not a product because it's permanent. That's completely legitimate as a consequence. Where is it, it? But if you if you didn't say it follows that, if you just pr presented it as a syllogism, it would not be a correct syllogism, right? Okay, so we're on the same same wavelength there. So in this context, um, in uh, Jeffrey Hopkins' meditation on emptiness, I've read a little of this before, but I'm going to read it again on page. 441, near the middle of the end of the page, it is a section called Debate. And Jeffrey Hopkins uh, says, this is from his Meditation on Emptiness. He says, Buddha Politz's refutation in his commentary on the first chapter of Nargajuna's treatise in the Middle Way. So that's what we're, we're talking about, the first chapter. We're talking about the first verse Mainly, we've been talking about the first verse of fundamental wisdom, that nothing is produced uh, from, not, from, or not from self, not from other, not from both, not from neither. Nothing is ever produced uh, at all. This, this is the famous first verse of uh, Nargajuna's fundamental wisdom, the, for the first verse of the first chapter, right? So here, Jeffrey is saying, Buddha Politz's refutation in, in commentary on the first chapter of Nargajuna's treatise in the Middle Way, his refutation of the Samkhya position that an effect is produced from a cause which is of the same nature as itself, drew heavy criticism from Bhava Viveka. So Bhava Viveka wasn't criticizing Buddha Politz because uh, you know, maybe you might think Buddha Polit, uh, Baba Viveka thought that things were produced from themselves. That's, that's not his position. He also completely re would refute the, the Samkhya position. But what he's what he is uh, criticizing Buddha Polit about is about his logical uh, use of syllogisms and so forth and. And uh, uh, let's, let's say his his use of consequences and syllogisms. Richard, what what, what do you think? Um, Venerable, could you just repeat the um, uh, what uh, Jeffrey Hopkins wrote? I'm sorry, I no, didn't no, quite no. get it the first time. Right. So he, he said in this uh, in this section on uh, called debate after naming the sources, he says. Buddha Polita's refutation in commentary on the first chapter of Nargajuna's treatise of the Middle Way of the Samkhya position, that means Buddha Polita's refutation of the Samkhya position that affects, that an effect is produced from a cause which is of the same nature as itself, drew heavy criticism from Bhava Viveka. So Buddha Polita was refuting the Samkhya position and Buddha Palita criticized that, you know, Buddha, Pal Buddha Palita's uh, commentary. So Buddha Palita wrote this commentary. That he's con he was contemporary with uh, uh, Baba Viveka. Okay, Baba Viveka usually we say is the founder of the what system? Does anyone know? John, what system was Baba Viveka the founder of? He's credited as the founder of the um, Madhyamaka uh, Svatantrika. Right, school. the Svatantrika system, right? Uh, if you go, if you 
if you deal in more detail of the Svatantrikas, which one would he be considered? Is he considered a Yogacara or a or the other? What's the other? Madhyamaka. Svatantrika, uh... Svatantrika. What's the so, question? Sorry. Is he a Satrantika? Sautrantika. Sautrantika. Yes, not Yogacara. Right. Not, right. His, not Yogacara, which the his disciples, Kamala Shila and uh, what was it called? Shantarakshita. Shantarakshita and Kamala Shila, Hari Bhadra, and so forth were more Yogacara. Okay. So, anyway, we know what that is. So, um, the text continues, an example, an examination of Buddha Palata's refutation, Bhava Viveka's criticism, and Chandrakirti's defense of Buddha Palata reveals central differences between the two divisions of the Majamaka, of the Majamika Prasangika, founded by Buddha Palata slash Chandrakirti. And the Svatantrika. Follow, uh, founded by Bhava Viveka. So here he doesn't distinguish Bhava Viveka as being a Latrantika. So the, the uh, Sampke position is the cause of a barley shoot. They do, <laughs> that's the example they're using, not just, a, not just a shoot or a sprout in general, but a barley, barley sprout or barley shoot the cause of a barley shoot is a barley seed and its minor causes, subsidiary causes, cooperative conditions are water, manure, and so forth. The nature of the cause and the and of the minor causes, the nature of the cause and of the minor causes is partless. And thus the nature of the seed is the nature of the water and of the of the manure and the nature of the and the nature of the water is the nature of the seed and the manure and so on for these causes have a common effect the barley shoot barley sprout exists at the time of the barley seed we're talking about the sampke position because the barley shoot abides in the nature of its causes right at the time when they are still causes and when the effect or manifestation has not yet been produced. So the, the barley sprout exists in the, the seed at an earlier time. For example, to give another example, a pot exists in the nature of the clay that will produce it. Therefore, the nature of the causes and the nature of the effect and the nature of the effect, because here we're talking about multiple causes giving one effect, therefore the nature of the causes and the nature of the effect are one and thus are each other. Okay, where this is uh, stuff that you already know, but just sort of being phrased in this in this particular context of the, the debate between uh, Buddha Palata, uh, between Bhava Viveka and Buddha Palita. Buddha Palita didn't sort of respond, right, to Buddha to Bhava Viveka's criticism. It was left sometime later when Chandrakirti was born and refuted Bhava Viveka that 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 the sort of the defense of Buddha Palita comes out. So uh Buddha, Buddha Palita flings consequences at the Samkhya's assertion. So this is this is what we're talking about, uh, Dokpa Pempa. Okay, so uh, he flings here. Here Jeffrey translates Pempa as flinging, <laughs> like that, flinging consequences at the Sampkins assertion. First, he sets his thesis. The thesis being. Things are not produced from their own entities. Things are not produced from their own entities. How is that a thesis? 
Snehi, do you know what a thesis means when we're talking about these logical arguments? It's what you want to prove or what you're asserting. So in terms of the elements of a syllogism, let's say, you have a subject, a predicate, and a sign. A predicate? Do any of those constitute the thesis? I would say the sound is impermanent as the thesis. Yeah, so that means the subject and the predicate, the predicate together. Together form the thesis, right? Just so we know what, what the terminology is. First, he sets his thesis. Things are not produced from their own entities. So the subject would be impermanent things, things, and the predicate are not produced from their own entities. So that's that doesn't give a reason yet. That's just that's just the thesis. So Buddha Palitza flings consequences at the, the Sampka's assertion. First, he sets his thesis. Things are not produced from their own entities. Then in answer to anyone's wondering what fallacies there are in asserting production from something which is of the same nature, he gives a brief refutation in the form of two consequences. So his thesis is things are not produced from their own entities. So the consequences would be if they are produced from their own entities, there are fallacies that their reproduction would be senseless. We had different ways of translating senseless, meaningless, uh, and so forth. Their reproduction, their production again, would be senseless. That means if the if they already, if the sprout already existed in the seed, its production again would be senseless. And another, not only that. It, that production would be endless. So we're familiar with both of those. Those were the uh, the logical reasons that Chantrakirti used in refuting the Sampka position that we've just gone over in the last couple of weeks. So then he says, Buddhapalita's actual words are, so this Buddha Palitza in our case is the good guy, right? <laughs> He's the Rasen Giga. Buddha, Palitza, Buddha Palitza's actual words are, things are not produced from their own entities because their production, again, would be just senseless and because production would be endless. The way he flings the consequence that reproduction would be senseless is it follows, so when you use the, the word it follows, that's usually, that's the, the Tibetan word telwa or the Sanskrit word prasanga that indicates that it's not a syllogism, that you're, you're stating a consequence. It follows with respect to the subject a sprout, that its production again is senseless because of already existing in its own entity. That makes sense, right? Buddha Palitza's position. That's more or less what Chandra Kurti was mentioning also. The Samkhya, however, holds that what is existent but unmanifest <clears throat> must be made manifest. So Samkhya position is that if something... Uh, you know, this is the general Samkhya position. There's another position talking about uh, whether it's apparent or not. Here we're just talking about manifest. The Samkhya, however, hold that what is existent, let's say at the time of the seed, but unmanifest at that time, must be made manifest. Therefore, a Samkhya, therefore he, Samkhya, might answer that it is not entailed you can say there's no pervasion, there's no necessity of something's already existing in its own entity that its production against again is senseless. It is not entailed by something's already existing in its own entity that its production against is sen it, again is senseless. You're following? Richard? 
was that as a negative, a negatory? <laughs> that was positively a negative. I'm not exactly sure. Uh, uh, I didn't quite follow the, the logic of the last part. I was following right, right, right. more or less up until then. So, so uh, in, in just before, at the very last lines of page 442 in Meditation on Emptiness, so uh, Jeffrey says, therefore, he, that means the Samkhya, might answer that it is not entailed by something's already existing in its own entity. Another way of saying that is, if something already exists in its own entity, something already existing in its own entity, uh, there's no necessity that its production, again, is senseless. That's what the Sampkhya would say. In that case, the second consequence of the endlessness of its production is flung, <laughs> is, yeah, is, is thrown. So that, that consequence is, it follows, that means it's a consequence, with respect to the subject, a sprout, that its production is endless because although it already exists in its own entity, in the seed, there, there is sense in its reproduction. There is sense or a need for its reproduction. That's, that's the consequence that... Uh, would be thrown to the Samkhya. So that then the commentary again continues, if the existent requires reproduction, if that which exists requires reproduction. So there's two senses here, it's playing on, because it exists in the seed, the sprout exists in the seed, you could say, if it exists in the seed and still requires reproduction as the sprout, and also, you're talking about the sprout. If the existent, the sprout, requires reproduction, that would mean it would have to be reproduced again. When it was unmanifest in the seed, it was existent, but if that required, someone's giving a thumbs up, I'm not sure what that means. Uh, if that required reproduction, and once it appeared as a sprout, that would also require reproduction. If the existent requires reproduction, then even when the effect is manifest, it would still require reproduction because it exists. Right? Following? Louise? Good. Shanka's given a thumb up. Okay. Richard, is that making more sense now? Okay. Anna? I know you You always say, I'm thinking. <laughs> I'm working. Is it making sense? It is, but my head feels twisty like Doris, but I'm hanging on like it makes sense, but don't get me to explain it, but I'm hanging okay. on. Okay, okay, yeah. Yeah, Doris, Doris is <laughs> Venerable, I think Judith has a question. Who has a question? Oh, Judith. Yeah, okay, Judith, go on. I'm totally new to the debate, so I might right, say right, right. that's completely outstanding. But there is a teleolog teleology in what you are saying in this debate. Okay, I don't know what a teleology is. What is a teleology? It's a purpose, a purposeful energy. Okay. What's the, why, why does this, the seed have to continue reproducing? Why does the sprout have to keep reproducing? Because it's the Samkhya, say, so the, um, Buddhapalita is pointing out, Buddhapalita was a Buddhist uh, who's trying to uh, explain uh, Nargajuna's first stanza, that things are not produced from themselves or other and so forth. So he's just centering now on the uh, not produced from self. So the, the Samkhya position is that uh, the sprout, 
this is, I'm, I'm using this hand as the sprout. <laughs> the sprout already existed at the time of the seed in an unmanifest form within the seed. Right. That's their position. Um, but if but if you were to hold that position, there are logical consequences uh, from that. That if the that which already existed at the time of the seed already existed has to be it has to be produced again. You could say again because it it already existed at the time of the seed. It has to be produced again. Then that which is produced again, the sprout, because it exists, it would have to be produced again. If if it, if the existent sprout in the seed, which was unmanifest, had to be produced again as the sprout, then the sprout itself would have to be produced again. That's the that's the gist of it, I think. Okay. Thank okay. you. If the existent requires reproduction, then even when the effect is manifest, it would still require reproduction because it exists. Buddhapalita says, the production again of things already existent in their own entities is purposeless, is senseless. If though existent, they are produced, that means if they're existent in the seed, Yet they, are, yet they are produced, they would never not be produced. <laughs> okay, double negatives again. They would never not be produced. That means they would always be produced. You know, uh -huh. once they were existent, then that, that existent sprout would have to be produced again. And then that, that new produced sprout would have to be produced again. You would have, it would just keep on being. Venerable, I have a question. So yes. we're talking about this, of course, the seed of the sprout, but and we're saying that it would have to be produced again. The sprout, the seed will have to produce endless sprouts, or that sprout that was produced is the one that is producing new sprouts. So here is the, the latter, that that sprout which is produced would have to be produced again. The other argument that came in our text was that we were talking about the seed would have to be produced again. That's just another variation. The fact that the seed would have to be, if the seed already existed, it would have to be produced again. That means the sprout could never appear if you look at it from that side. That's another argument. So we're not talking about that one. We're just talking about here that once the sprout is produced and is existent, uh, it would have to be produced again. If By the same seed? Not, not talking about the seed, just the sprout. Mm -hmm. the sprout, uh, if if the sprout already existed in the seed, unmanifestly, okay, and then it becomes manifest as the sprout. That means that which already existed in the seed, the sprout, had to be produced again. Then what? What? Why not that sprout, which is now existent, why wouldn't it have to be produced again? It would have to be produced again. The same sprout. That same sprout. Same sprout. sprout. Yeah, like same in sprout. Having double sprout? Not talking about the seed, just saying that that same sprout would have to be produced again. And it and once it's produced, that, <laughs> that newly produced sprout would have to be produced again. So these are absurd consequences, you know. You, the you, sprout you know, would be the one producing the new sprouts. Yes, or? yes. The sprout oh, would be yes. with, with with that which is producing the new sprout because it already existed. Okay, there the sprout, already. not the seed. The sprout, yeah. the seed produces. Yes, one yes. Sprout. Get get rid of the seed. We're not talking about okay. the seed. Okay. And it would be producing the it's, the sprout would be producing itself. Yes. Yes. Okay. Exactly the same the sprout. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mary Ellen, what do you think? It's um, maybe a good time now to take a stretch break. Okay, no, no, maybe, maybe just a, let, let's just get a little bit further, and we'll we'll take a break. Thanks for reminding us, because I'm uh, my medical assistants have suggested my because my blood <laughs> sitting cross legged for too long, uh, my blood pressure might get too high. So it's. Just, so it's good to take a little break. I'll lay down for a minute, but we'll do that in, in, in a second. 
So that's that's more or less what's being talked about here. Then Jeffrey says, the Samkhya holds that what has already been manifested need not be produced. That's about what we're, that's one of the, the things that is coming in Lama Swan Kappa's text in a minute when they're refuting. If it's already manifested, you know, originally it's unmanifest in the seed, then it becomes manifested as a sprout. So the Samkhya holds that what has already been manifested, you know, it's come out of the seed as when it was unmanifest, it now becomes manifest. It need not be produced again. Therefore, he, the Samkhya, might again answer that there is no entailment, there is no pervasion that it would have to be produced again. However, his answer, the Samkhya answer, does not hit the mark, for by switching from the vocabulary of production, the seed is produced or born to manifested, by switching from the vocabulary of production to that of manifestation, he, here the he is always referring to Samkhya, cannot escape inquiry about whether the manifestation exists at the time of its unmanifest state. Okay, so you can follow, you can read uh, Jeffrey's commentary at that point that was on page 443. Um, and so I'm going to leave that for a second. We'll go back to that, but let's go back to our text. So given all these undesired consequences, and furthermore, given that, that we do not perceive them as not being distinct, distinct, that is that we do perceive the seed and the sprout as being different, the realities of these two, a seed and a sprout, cannot be identical in all ways, in all respects. In this way, Chandrakirti throws to his Samkhya opponent the reverse of the consequence. There is, however, a great difference between throwing the reverse of a consequence and throwing the reverse of a consequence that, that contains an autonomous syllogism. So there's the tricky part, right? Richard, do you agree? Yes, I do. I think that I, I I agree that it's a little tricky, but isn't basically the um, the difference uh, the difference that that the conse the consequence doesn't doesn't describe anything uh, anything positive. It, it's basically just um, describing the consequences of of holding to a wrong position, while the um, the autonomous syllogism um, establishes something that the other party can't possibly agree to because it's because the other party's holding wrong premises. That's sort of how I understand. It. Okay, that's related to this, but that's not exactly what's being said here. First of all, uh, it, it's very close to what's being said. Um, so when when the consequence so when he's talking about the reverse of the consequence, the consequence means uh, what um, here, Chandrakirti, because we're referring to Chandrakirti's text now, we're not referring back to Bhava Viveka and Buddha Palata, we're, we're just referring to Chandrakirti's consequence. Uh, he's saying, in this way, Chandrakirti throws to his Samkhya opponent the reverse of the consequence. So that means that uh, Chandrakirti has given a consequence, absurd consequences, that uh, if the the sprout existed in the in the seed at the time of the seed, uh, its reproduction would be senseless and would be endless. Those two consequences, right? Those are the consequences. So throwing the reverse of the consequences. What would the reverse of that consequence be? Say, say the first consequence, Nadine. Uh, it follows that the uh, reproduction would be endless. What's the reverse of that consequence? 
Let's say sorry, it I, can't, I, I don't know. Oh no, okay. You don't know? Mm -hmm. So what is the what is the actual consequence there? Who can enunciate the consequence? Paul, can you enunciate the consequence? The first one? I, I think so, Venerable George. So the consequence is uh if the sprout existed at the time of the seed, then it's okay, reproductive. Oh, 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 sorry, but yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, it follows that. <laughs> right, right. Um, it's the, the underlying assumption, right? Right. But, right. but the yeah. consequence is it follows that uh, um, the uh, reproduction uh, would be endless. Oh, I'm trying senseless. senseless. Yeah, either one it would be sense. Yeah. Let's say senseless first would be senseless. Senseless, um, because of of existing at the uh, because of already existing. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, something like that. It follows that the subject sprout. The sprout, right? Uh, or the, the production of the. Of the of the the subject, the production of a sprout would be senseless because of already existing. Okay, so then what would be the reverse of that? So the reverse of that, which is what he's referring to here, is that because the Samkhya says, "Well, no, that's not the case." Then he says, "Then it follows that." Well, the, the reverse of the syllogism is going to oh, come mm -hmm. as a. Uh, the reverse of the consequence, consequence is going to become become a syllogism, syllogism. It no longer follows, right? Right, right. Uh, which is that um, the um, the two, the sprout and the seed, uh, are not identical in all respects. Is that right? No. <laughs> you reverse the. Okay, a little bit tricky. Uh, yeah, I, I have to think about it. <laughs> yeah, so we have to think. So, um, Snehi, how are you doing? Do you have a, you have a, an opinion on this? Nope. No. <laughs> okay, good. Good America. Good New York. Nope. Would wouldn't the wouldn't the reverse of the consequence simply be? Um, it would follow that. The um, it would not be endless if um, if it does not exist in the in the um, in the um, in the cause. Wouldn't that be the reverse of the consequence? It would that, not be endless that, if it one doesn't. Could, exist. One could think okay. that possibly. One could think that. Let, let me read it a little more from uh, first Shanka. So wouldn't? But I was thinking if the rever if the reverse of a consequence is another syllogism, right? Um, then would it be the syllogism using the reverse pervasion? Yeah. Okay. Right. It would be the reverse. It would be say if you have a if you have a consequence that you have. Uh, you have given, you stated, the consequence of the Samkhya's position would be that uh, the reproduction would be senseless and uh, its reproduction would not stop. It would be endless. Okay, that's kind of the, that's kind of the consequence you're, 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 you're giving to the Samkhya position. And so uh, let me, let me read again from Jeffrey Hopkins. Um, this is on now on page 444. Employing a reason and a pervasion approved by the opponent, a consequence of his views which contradicts another of his views is presented to him. So this is talking about <clears throat> what the consequence that you present to the, the Sampkya has to be. It has to have a reason and a pervasion approved by the opponent. Okay. So, for instance, if among the various tenets of a school there was the assertion that's, that a sound is permanent, 
that sound is a product and that all products are impermanent, the following consequence would be stated. So this is not the this is not obviously not talking about the sprout and the and the seed. This is just talking about a general example, famous example. It follows, that means it's a consequence. It follows that the subject, a sound, is not a product because of being permanent, because of being a permanent phenomenon. The opponent himself accepts the reason that sound is permanent, right? That's their 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 position, the Vedic Vedic position that the that the sound of the Vedas is eternal and permanent. Okay. The opponent himself has accepted the reason that a sound is a permanent phenomena. He has accepted the pervasion that whatever is a permanent phenomena phenomenon is not a product. Is it this this the the uh, consequence? It follows that the subject sound is not a product because of being permanent. So he has accepted the pervasion, the forward pervasion. Whatever is a permanent phenomena is not a product. Thus, he is forced to accept the unwanted thesis. What's the thesis? The subject sound is not a product that a sound is not a product. And this contradicts his own view that sound is a product. You know, the Samkhya's or the, you know, the Vedic would accept that sound is created uh, as a product of causes and conditions. The stator of the consequence would say, the three spheres have been accepted. John, do you know what they say in the de debating courtyard? What, what did it say? What is it? The three spheres have been accepted. Duh, probably. <laughs> <laughs> All, you know, what is it? Corsum. Corsum. You know, so <laughs> when you're hearing the debates, uh, okay, so you're throwing a consequence, you're giving a consequence, stating a consequence to someone, and uh, they they have to accept that because they it has the property of the subject and the forward provision, but they're not they're not going to want to accept the uh, the thesis. This means, when it says the three spheres have been accepted, this means that the reason, the pervasion of the reason by the predicate of the consequence and the opposite of the consequence have been accepted. The simple consequence above also implies its opposite meaning. So this is, this is when you're talking about, so the consequence has been stated, now when you fling a syllogism from that. You know, when it was says Tokpa Pemba, that means the reverse of the consequence is thrown to the person. So this sample consequence above also implies or throws its opposite meaning. And that would be the subject sound is an impermanent phenomenon because of being a product. So the opposite of the original reason is put as the predicate of, of the implied thesis. That is, permanent phenomena becomes impermanent phenomenon. The opposite of the predicate of the original thesis in the, in the uh, consequence is put as the reason of the implied syllogism. That is, is not a product, becomes a product. To repeat the consequence, it follows that the subject sound is not a product because of being permanent, applies the syllogism, throws the syllogism, the reverse. The subject sound is impermanent because of being a product. You have to sort of, you'll have to either read it or write it down and think about it till this starts to gel in your mind. Yeah. Through the statement of the consequence, a consciousness that infers the implied opposite meaning is generated in the opponent. So this is a crucial point. Through the statement of the consequence alone, a consciousness that infers the implied opposite meaning, the correct syllogism, 
is generated in the opponent. The non-Prasangika schools, the Svatantrika and lower, also use consequences to break down the vibrance or pointedness of the opponent's adherence to his own view. However, they do not accept that a consequence alone can generate in the opponent a consciousness inferring the implied thesis. You following? Just think, six months ago, you have no idea. Maybe, maybe right now you'll say, I have no idea what's being said, but six months ago, you would have had no idea what was being said. There, you, we've, got, we've gone a long way. However, they do not accept that a consequence alone, the non prasangikas can generate in the opponent a consciousness inferring the implied thesis. This is the prasangika position. Prasangika asserts that a statement of a consequence alone is sufficient, provided the opponent is intelligent and ready, to such an opponent, a further explicit statement of a syllogism is purposeless. This is why Buddhapalita didn't state, Buddhapalita is a good guy, right? Buddhapalita didn't state syllogisms. He just gave the consequences. The intent is to generate in the opponent an inferring consciousness, though not necessarily through the route of implying the opposite meaning as just explained. For instance, Buddhapalita's consequences above are intended to generate in the Samkhya a consciousness which infers that there is no production from self and not that there is production from others. It's not, it's not, not inferring anything else. It's just, it's just um, inferring that there is no production from self. Okay. Further on, many pages beyond that, um, let me just read a little bit, a little bit more. This is on page four forty nine. If you're, if you happen to have uh, access to that book, it says much like a consequence, right? Consequences and syllogisms, right? Much like a consequence, a syllogism or jorwa, and and Sanskrit prayoga, um, a syllogism consists of a thesis and a reason. You can say a subject, a predicate, and a reason, or you can, because the subject and the predicate form the thesis, you can say a thesis and a reason, right? Make sense? Okay. I, I was waiting for Nadine to nod. She, she, she was, okay. Okay. However, in the logic school of Dignaga and Dharmakirti, the stator of a syllogism must himself or herself, accept the reason's presence in the subject, the pervasion of the reason by the predicate, and the pervasion of the negative of the predicate by the negative of the reason. In other words, the, the stator of a syllogism, syllogism has to accept the property of the subject. You know, that the, the subject of the, of the syllogism is the reason. He has to accept the forward provision and the reverse provision. Generally, you don't have to have, you don't have to accept both. You just accept one that's sufficient. For instance, the subject hot is an impermanent thing because of being arisen from exertion, just as, for example, speech is arisen from exertion and is impermanent. So that's giving, given, giving an example also. The stator of the syllogism must accept the reason's presence in the subject, the property of the subject, that the subject is the reason, right? Or was I? The stator of the sub syllogism must accept the reason's presence in the subject, that a pot is arisen from exertion, they must accept the pervasion that all things arisen from exertion are impermanent, and they have to accept the counter pervasion that all permanent things are not arisen from exertion. 
However, in the case of a consequence, neither subject, predicate, nor reason need be accepted by the stater. That's why, you know, Buddha Palita can state a consequence, an absurd consequence, which is completely legitimate, because in the case of a consequence, neither the subject, predicate, nor reason need be accepted by the stater. It is only necessary that the, po the opponent accept or be forced from his own position, his own position to accept these three. Consequences are means of dealing with opponents on their own grounds. And Chandrakirti declares that if the opponent will not accept the consequence stemming from his own views, will not accept consequences stemming from their own views, there is no point in proceeding to state a syllogism to them. Sean, what do you think? I just wanted to make sure I'm following. So what you're saying is, so they had an original syllogism, but the Samkhya's didn't accept something in the syllogism. No, no, so you, you, would even, you wouldn't even present them the syllogism. You know that they won't accept because of their statements, right? But more or less what you're saying. Okay. Well, either, either way, then yeah. you present them a consequence. You, you present they, them a consequence of their wrong views, right? Right. But then if they accept any of that consequence, then you can reverse the consequence back to the syllogism, and then they're forced into accepting the syllogism. Is that the, what I'm hearing? Forced into accepting the thesis, which they, like, for instance, they accept the, the property of the subject and the pervasion, but now they're they're forced with, uh, let's say, uh, if we talk about sound is impermanent, that that sound is impermanent, uh, which they they didn't want to accept. They 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 didn't want to accept. Okay, Mary Ellen, what do you think? It's the same request for the okay. Let's, let's take a short break. Uh, if you need to have a cup of tea. Go. I'll leave it. I'll leave my microphone unmuted so I can listen and comment. If you have, you know, you can debate here just for this three, four minutes, five minutes, whatever we take. <laughs> Which might be, moistening, might be moistening the sprout. Come back. Slowly get back. Um, so the this addition here in Jeffrey's uh, text. One is talking about the uh, the cooperative conditions. Also, in our text, in Lama Sonkapa's text, comes up. This is from the original Samkhya position. Remember when we were talking about the uh, generality of product, right? So, products are things that are impermanent. They are rise from causes and conditions. They arise through exertion in some cases, um, not in all cases, but in some cases. Uh, so each of those elements of uh, product, each of those individual instances of product, all, sh are, all share the same nature. Whereas for Buddhists, that, that's the Samkhya position. For Buddhists, all of the individual elements do not necessarily share the same nature. Say, within products, uh, just to give one of the classic examples, say horse and uh, elephant or horse and mule or whatever, they are elements, they are instances of products, but they don't share the same nature. They're not the same nature. Whereas for Samkhya, all of those elements are the same nature. They, they share that same prakriti. In the prakriti or the general principle, prahan, they are all exactly the same. Uh, and so that's that's a little bit what's talking about here when you start to extend it to the cooperative conditions. 
as they are also products, manure and water and so forth, they all share uh, the same nature as the seed and the sprout. John, what do you think? Um, when uh, when Chandrakirti is describing the Sankhya position, and as far as we know the Sankhya position, they're saying that the cause and the effect are have the same nature, correct? That's correct, right? That the yeah. seed and sprout share the uh, identical nature. Right. Shh, hush. <laughs> I hope that wasn't Bob. No, no, it's, it's one of my many creatures. Um, okay. Hush. This is is in the in the Tibet house. I assume that's Bob's. Bob Thurman. No, 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 no. I'm just on there. I'm just on their Zoom. So the my my question is, I I I believe this is coming up in the text. So, uh, but I already don't quite. I already don't understand it. So I'm preparing myself. Do not doesn't uh, Tsongkhapa himself also say, and the Madhyamakas also say that because of emptiness, these things are no chikpa. They are. Of that's a different. That's a different. That's a different entity. It's a they different are, use of that word. It, yes, it, 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 when you're saying that uh, all phenomena, uh, let's say that when we say the conventional nature and the ultimate nature of some phenomena, let's say a seed. Just to, I hope that doesn't confuse now, we're because we're now going we're diverting away from the scenario that we're in. So if you talk about a seed, it has a conventional nature and an ultimate nature. So those two natures form one entity, but they are different. The conventional nature is not the ultimate nature, and the ultimate nature is not con the conventional nature, right? Right. Are, they are different when we talk about, uh, oh, what do we say? Uh, they are no jikla dok patade. They are one entity, but different conceptual isolates. Right. Um, so, so that, have, that, that... That will be coming up again, in the, and we've talked about it in tenants and other classes. So they are, they are one entity, but still within being one entity, they are still... Uh, conceptually different. Snehi, what do you think? And well, George, I just wanted to use your, you know, the example you you said about if when you are Buddhist and you're looking at an elephant and uh, a horse, you won't say they're of the same nature, correct? Right. So, you know, in my mind, I always like think if you are if. As, they're, as not a the same, they're not the same entity. They're not. They're not the same not entity. The same. So but, for instance, uh, if you look at a horse and you were to say, I see an elephant, other people would say, no, you're you're crazy. That's that's not a horse. That's not an elephant. That's a horse. I, I thought I thought I heard you say that for Buddhists, a horse and an elephant are not of the same nature. I might have said that, yeah. They're, okay. not, they're, the same, they're not of the same, in, in a sense, they're not of the same entity. Because this is where I just am stuck at this point, because, you know, for scientists, everything is made up of the same building blocks, right? I know. However, I know. right, whatever we want to call them. So for a scientist, an elephant and a horse are not the same entity, they would agree but they would say once you start deconstructing them, they're all made up of the same building blocks. Yeah, however, that's, you want to. It's different them. than saying the same entity or same nature to say to say but they're all I, built of the same. But I don't. But this blocks. is the thing, and, you know, John and and you know who understand Samkhya better. But I don't think Samkhya is saying that the seed and the sprout are the same entity. You know that they're yeah, uh, that they're they, identical. They any. They're That's just their position. They're, they're, they're saying that it, it, within the prakriti, within the fundamental nature, uh, the general principle, there's other names for it, synonyms, the 
Rahan, or if, if there's another syllable in that, um, that they are within that they are of the same nature. They are, uh, you know, whatever, wh wherever you have one, wherever you have a seed, you also have the sprout. Wherever you have the seed, you also have manure and water is the same nature. Even the, even the nature of the water of your tea is in there. Even the nature of an elephant is in there. Uh, remember the the quotation that Geshe gave from Pramodavartika, uh, where Dharmakirti was teasing the Samkhyas, saying, "You know how foolish on the on the tip of a blade of grass uh, there are a hundred elephants, and so forth." So everything exists in that nature. Okay, let's leave that for some time. Uh, I want to go just a little bit further after answering Suvansha's question. Otherwise, we haven't we haven't even gotten to the point where we are we're supposed to start today. So, Suvansh. Uh, Venerable George, um, I, you know, um, as I read this material, I'm um, less interested in, uh, yeah, I, well, I, I, what what uh, rings louder to me is the original statement uh, of Nagarjuna and Chandrakirti, uh, as opposed to their refutation of the Samkhya school. The okay. original statement being, an entity does not arise from itself. Right. Okay. Right. You would right. say that that is a thesis. Right. Okay. So, um, I, I'm, I'm not here to counter that position, but I'm here to clarify my understanding. Okay. So here's my question for you. Do the Buddhists, do Buddhists in, you know, across their literature, do they claim that any entity is primordial? Because for me, the word primordial, to say that an entity is primordial means that it has existed, um, it has existed uh, from the very beginning. Right. Uh, and its existence is, um, is kind of, um, you know, I, I guess is, uh, it, it's, it exists. So if something exists, to me, it means that uh, it, it, it operates in the same way. It has the same kind of behavior. It has the same kind of characteristics. Okay, so we're talking about different contexts here. So in Buddhism, we do in especially yeah. in the in the Mahayana, and in and in particular in Tantra, we do talk about the primordial nature. The primordial nature is that all things from the very beginning, without you know, without time, have always been empty of inherent existence. Or when we talk about the in our prayers at the beginning, at the end, when we talk about the, I use the term primordial guru, uh, dome, dome lama, uh, from the beginning, our, you know, the the primordial guru in a sense is the <clears throat> dharmakaya, the primordial dharmakaya that has existed from the beginning and has always been guiding us in some way. So we do talk about primordial, but uh, that's not entering into the discussion here. That's another but, context. Uh, so, right, right, right. But, but I think that that's what I'm saying, right? I, 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 I'm, I'm trying to just stay with the position, which is that an entity does not exist, does not arise from itself. Okay. Right, and right. so, so what, what I asked over here was that what is the definition of primordial? And you said that. Uh, all phenomena have been empty, right? Um, you know, fr from from the very. That's beginning. not the definition of primordial. That's an example of primordial. That's Something. an example of primordial. Okay, fair. Yes, yes. But I, 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 I uh, in other words, the state of the entity has been empty from the very beginning. Right. It's not as though okay. emptiness came about later. Yeah. 
right correct correct right but also i would i i i would say that some of the places that i've i've heard you know i i i can quote you texts right where i read primordial primordial wisdom primordial dimension primordial enlightenment etc right so mm -hmm. much more than emptiness it seems yeah, yeah, that yeah, yeah. Least they're, they're, they're all they're all getting down to the same thing something say for instance primordial the wisdom same thing primordial wisdom yes yes uh, that would be an attribute of the of the primordial dharmakaya okay right that is well, okay, 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 it's but, not as though... but, but 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 i mean dharmakaya dharmakaya you see you, here, here, here you're saying you see earlier you said emptiness right you you, you gave exam uh, emptiness as, as an example of right. primordial and now i think you you so so now are you saying that Yes, dharmakaya is also primordial. No, not all dharmakaya. There is a primordial dharmakaya. Okay, okay, fair, fair, fair. So there is when Marpa or whoever became when Milarepa became enlightened, and his dharmakaya became manifest. That is not primordial dharmakaya. Primordial dharmakaya uh, is a little bit, you know, getting into tantric subject that there has been. Uh, you know, if you go back in the past, uh, there was who was the first Buddha? <laughs> you know, there's no beginning. There's no ex there's no beginning to time. So there's always been uh, some Dharma Kaya has that existed uh, previously. So you can refer to that as the primordial Dharma Kaya because it existed then, and it's existed ever since. So you you would you would refer to it as primordial dharmakaya, but okay. let's 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 can we leave that for the time being? We can ex we can um, let's address that. I, okay, I, 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 all 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 I'll say is that um, once you once you say that an entity is primordial, then to me it means that from one moment to the next it arises from itself. No, 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 no. That's that's a good point. That's an important point to so. So let's let's just address that for a moment, and then and then uh, <laughs> fling that away. So, uh, for instance, if you have a continuum, let's say our mind stream is primordial. Would you agree? Our mental consciousness, our subtle most mental consciousness. So our subtle most mental consciousness. Yes, they say that the subtle most consciousness does not go from. Uh, it has uh, will, will continue. Will will, it will continue. It's existed in the past, without beginning. Yes. Okay. So that's primordial. But each instant of that consciousness, let's say that's a continuum, right? I don't want to use that. Got it. So right. it it has individual instants. Each one instant of that, which is the cause of the next instant. Yes. The next instant. Did not did not exist in the previous instant. Okay, okay. It's the cause. It, it, it is. It's <clears throat> that previous instant was the the cause of the next instant. I don't know if someone just yes, looking, yes, yes. I would understand. I'm, 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 so, I'm with you, Venerable George. So, in other words, what you're saying is, even for the Dharmakaya, it's the same situation, which from instant to instant, it is not the same. Because I do know that one of the, the other assertion that the, that the Buddhists make is that everything, well, they use the word primordial, but they also say everything is empty. So th that's, well, that's what I'm trying to understand, right? right. I mean, if you but, say but, that... So two different situations, Sumash. Consciousness is an impermanent phenomena. Emptiness is permanent. Right? So you're, you're talking about apples and oranges here. That that primordial consciousness, every instant of it arose from a previous instant which was different from itself. So we would say there is other production. The next instant of consciousness is right. the previous, not the previous instant uh, didn't have right. within it the next instant of consciousness. Right, right. I'm, I'm, but, I'm but with they you. All had the same nature of emptiness. Yes, I, I'm I'm with you on that, Venerable George. But you said earlier that 
you said emptiness is primordial. And then you also said there's a primordial dharmakaya. So now I'm just talking about that dharmakaya. And you're saying uh, what, what I think you, I hear you say is that even in the case of the dharmakaya, it, it's not the same from instant to instant. That's right. It's impermanence. Dharmakaya. Got it. Talk you. about if you talk about the wisdom dharmakaya, you could talk about the svavavikakaya, which is the nature of the uh, of the of the dharmakaya, which is it, its emptiness. That's different. But uh, the, the word primordial just means existing from the beginning. So there are some things that yes. existed from the beginning that are permanent. There's some things that existed from the beginning that are impermanent. Got it. Thank okay. you. Wow. Wow. Good. Okay. So let's start from where we were meant to start today. So this is uh, page uh, 201 in Jimpa, 106 in the FPMT text. So Jimpa says, potency here refers to such products, such properties. So where, did, where does he get a uh, potency from um, that came earlier in verse 610, just a couple of paragraphs above that, where it says, for you then there cannot exist a sprout distinct from the seed that causes it in shape, color, taste, potency, and ripened effects. So he's, <clears throat> Lama Tsongkhapa is giving uh, commentary on the word potency. Potency here refers to such properties as that of medicine, against hemorrhoids, you might joke a little, you know, <laughs> like getting salt, using salty kind of, uh, sort of earthy kind of examples, uh, hemorrhoid medicine, uh, which clears away the ailment the moment it comes in contact with the body. I think that means uh, with the, the hemorrhoids, uh, you know, on the body. So there were some kind of medicines that were renowned at that time uh, that could cause that to uh, clear away. It doesn't mean in an instant, but that as soon as it comes, you know, you put it on the body and it has the potency to get rid of the hemorrhoids. And it also, and also, so potency also refers to that of some medicinal essences that permeate the surroundings when hung in the air. Paul, do you have a comment on that? You you were the copy editor of this. <laughs> uh, I'm actually I'm looking at the Tibetan right now to see exactly what he says what he means by that. Um, yeah. so uh, he, he's missed something there. So he, it it says here. Uh, Semen Sok Gashik Changwa or Changba. Changba Tsangi. Like really holding some, some kind of medicinal. Yeah. Herb. I think uh, what he's I think. La Drowa Tabu. Yeah. Drowa here means go to travel yeah. in the sky. Yeah. He's think... taking that Drowa probably is uh, uh, a, a word, Troa. That means emanate or permeate. Al pa wrapped up pa naro po, like 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 to emanate or to. Right. to. So he's probably was hearing that sound and thought it it, it was talking about permeate. But uh, as Joan Venerable Joan translated, uh, And like traveling in the sky by merely holding some elixir and so forth. So it should be traveling in the sky rather than permeating uh, the air. Geshe Zopa said about this, some kind of hemorrhoid medicine, uh, talking about the seed and sprout, for example, uh, a medicinal herb, as soon as it is close to the body, wherever there are hemorrhoids, that, medi that medicine has the power or ability to clear away. So this is talking about the word potency in the original verse. Um, some kind of medicinal herbs or certain things, by holding that, your body, you may a little bit fly or something. And then Geshe was joking, do you want to buy that one? <laughs> The whole class, the, the whole class started laughing. Jeffrey, Jeffrey, 
you know, Geshe Lewis jogging. So it's it's definitely talking about a, a herb that you hold that has the ability, the potency to allow you to fly. Mm. I think I think uh, the way Jimbo was taking it was I think he was taking it as a different type of medicine where you had one that has to be in physical contact with the body, but then others that could be like, you know, vaporized. That, yeah, like it would, it would not there be anything that would have to be physically contact, but as long as it was in the air and you inhaled it, it would have. Right. That's effect. what's that's what he's that's what he's implying. But that's not what the text says. The yeah. text is actually talking about a medicinal herb. By holding it, you are able to fly. Yeah. By merely holding. Go in, go in the sky. Namkala yeah, no. Not yeah. Namkala. Not, not, not Namkala. You definitely Nam need a prescription for that one. Yeah. Right. Okay, so anyway, so th this another list of little errors that crept into uh, to Jimpa's translation. Uh, incredible, if you were to just look at the length of this translation, the fact that there are as few errors as, as we've noted up till now is, just shows the, the amount of erudition and uh, knowledge that Jimpa has of the subject. But there are some things like that. So... Um, and that are some medicinal essences that permeate the surroundings when hung in the air. So that should be medicinal essences that allow you to fly in the mm -hmm. in this in space. Mm -hmm. Then the word ripened effects in that in that verse six ten, it said in shape, color, taste, potency, and ripened effects. Or uh, in other words, we say maturation. Uh, uh, okay, so ripened effects or maturations are the changes affected in results owing to variable conditions. For example, when the Indian gooseberry and long pepper trees and their like are nourished with milk, their fruits acquire a sweet taste. So, um, Yeah. So uh, Geshe Zopa said uh, about this, he said, maturation, that's the ripened effects, means from seed to sprout, changing this quality by different conditions, by different ken. This is, for example, here, substance itself is actually manifested differently because of those cooperative conditions. For example, Kurara uh, or amalaki, a sour medicinal fruit, which Chimpuk said is gooseberry or something like that, and pipiling or piper longum, which is a proper name of a kind of uh, long pepper, their nature is to be sour, but from soaking them in milk, they become sweet and nice to eat. Uh, and Geshe said, we do that for breakfast. <laughs> so there must be some experience of the of the Tibetans also from using this, this kind of sour medicinal fruit, soaking it in milk, it becomes actually sweet. Uh, many things change taste by the power of milk. Substance changes due to other conditions to manifest or change like that. So that kind of nupa, that kind of power, uh, different ability, power as well as color and shape and everything uh, changes occur. If every cause and effect were the same in nature, if they were not different, they would be partlessly the same nature. You could not have these differences with the cause and effect. If you do have the temporary, uh, the, uh, if you do have the san, sanyupni, the, the temporary seed and the sprout, they're going, they are ngowo chik, they are one entity, then these different kinds of consequences could be thrown. Okay, anyway, let's let's leave that. For example, when Indian gooseberry and gooseberry and long pepper trees and their like are nourished with milk, 
their fruits acquire a sweet taste. Okay. So now the next section, I just, <laughs> this, this is where that, that state, that paragraph is where we're supposed to start today. So we're just going to just get a little bit into the next one, just because we just reached after three o'clock. The, the next section is refuting the responses aimed at rebutting the objections. So this is going to be Samkhya trying to defend themselves against uh, the arguments that Nargajuna, Chandrakirti, Buddha Palata, and so forth have, have put up. So this is the, the last two lines of uh, verse 10 of the sixth chapter, 610 CD. It is through shunning its pro prior reality that a thing turns into another thing. How then can the two be identical? So there are two statements there. One is the statement of the uh, Samkhya. Uh, they're, they're saying it's by giving up its prior reality that a thing turns into another thing. And then the Prasangika response would be, how then can the two be identical? So it's not clear in the in the verse right there that there's two different things that are being talked about there. So uh, Jimpa's text continues, a commentary. Uh, the Samkhya might assert, you might assert, he says, or it just says, if it's asserted, by abandoning the seed stage, remember we have the seed and the sprout, right? By giving up the state, the stage, uh, or the state of being a seed, by abandoning the seed stage, it changes into a different state, namely that of the sprout. This is a Sampika position. They're trying to defend themselves. The seed and the sprout are merely different stages. The seed itself becomes the sprout. Making sense? Position? Okay, so the Prasangika would answer, now, if it is through shunning its prior stage, or as, as Venerable uh, Joan translated, we would say shunning, giving up, what is it, what does she say here? If having eliminated the state of the thing, which is itself the previous seed, it transforms into the entity of the state of the sprout, which is other than the state of the seed, at the time of asserting such, how is it logical to say the very nature of the seed is that, the nature of the sprout itself? Okay, complicated how she's translated there. Jippa said, now, if it is through shunning its prior stage, Gelte, Ngargi Savungi Daki Ngopo Nekap Selne. So in, in Tibetan we say have uh selne means eliminating the context, the, the nekap, the, the state of Sabongi Daki Ngopo. So it's a little bit complicated in Tibetan. It's using two different words here for nature. Uh, Jimpa translated as through sh shunning the prior stage, the stage of the reality of the seed, Sabongi Daki Ngopo. John and uh, Paul, who are more Tibetan, more conversant with Tibetan, will be puzzling over that a little bit. But at any rate, uh, what they're saying is that uh, by abandoning, you know, so, so the, the response of President Giga says, now, if you if it is through giving up its prior stage or shunning its prior stage, the stage of the reality of the seed, that it turns into the stage that is another thing, which is the reality of the sprout, if that were the case, how can it be correct to assert that the two are identical, which is the basic Samkhya position, basic Samkhya thesis, if you want, that, that the seed and the sprout are of the same nature. How can it be correct to assert that the two are identical, such that the nature of the seed is also the very nature of the sprout? 
For according to you, Samkhya, the reality that is the the reality at that stage is the reality of that thing itself. So whatever stage you're talking about, if you're talking about the stage or the context of the seed or the context of the sprout, the reality at that stage and that context is the reality of that thing itself. And apart from that reality, there is no other thing that is separate. Therefore, the thesis that the reality of the seed and the sprout, this is the Samkhya position, their thesis, that the reality of the seed and the reality of the sprout are not distinct at all in any respect, is undermined, is sort of contradicted. So I'm not sure if Paul's Paul's mudra like this and Snay and Snehi's mudra like this, maybe even they were thinking. Mary Ellen's also got her thinking mudra on there. Shankas, his more like the thinker, the famous statue and uh, by Rodan. Has anyone ever seen the thinker? Um, I, I, I think there's there's a there's replicas around. I think there's, yes, a, yeah. well, there's replicas I, on Columbia University's campus. <laughs> oh, there you are. Uh, when I was in Philadelphia, there was I lived just a block away from the Rodin Museum. There, there was supposed to be one of the all of the replicas. I'm not sure if there was ever an original rep, you know, of of the bronze that you can point is maybe the Rodin Museum in France or something. But anyway. Um, so let's continue one, one more paragraph here. If the thought occurs, that would be to the Samkhya, although the shapes and so forth of the seed and the sprout are different, they're distinct, they are not distinct with respect to their substance. They are not different with respect to their substance. So there is no contradiction in the thesis of self-arising. Again, this is Samkhya. Right. If the, if that's thought, if that's if you were proposed that you samkhyas, this too would be untenable. This too is incorrect. For without apprehending the shapes and so on, one cannot apprehend the seed and the sprout, even in terms of their substance. Okay, so we're going to begin next time. <laughs> haven't even gone a page with this next outline, refuting using the consequence that in both situations, its perceptibility or lack thereof would be the same. I'm going to see if I can change on my computer here that color of that highlight. I'm going to make that green. Okay, so that's where we're going to start next time. So what I would suggest is if you can... Um, read in Jeffrey Hopkins' Meditation on Emptiness. Wasn't a PDF of that made available at some point on our? Yes, I, 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 I put a copy of it in chat, actually. The, the, the page is 443 and then 449, I think. Okay. A copy of it in, in the chat, and it's, it's on the Dropbox. Okay, so if people can take can, can read that and start to see, uh, you know, these different contexts when we talked about sound is impermanent because it's a product that that the the uh, sprout arises from a seed which is of the same nature. All of these different arguments. What Buddhapalita Buddhapalita was not talking about sound is impermanent. He was talking about uh, refuting the Sampaka position that a sprout arises from itself, you know, that there is self-production or self-generation. What is the Tibetan word? Uh, is John here also? Did John disappear? I'm here. Oh, there you are, yeah. So, John or Paul, what's the Tibetan word for that Jim is translating as arising uh, that we also talk about production? What's the Tibetan word? Must be Gewa, right? Gewa, right? 
So how is, is there's two different uh, spellings. One is a transitive verb and one is an intransitive. Is this gewa the transitive or the intransitive? Right, this is the, uh, the, it's the owl. Yeah, well, I actually don't see this, it's spelling, but I think it is the um, intransitive. Oh. And I think it's translating ut, utpada. Um, I'm trying to find it in the Tibetan. I'm not seeing where he's. Production from self, production from others in general. In so theory, you would, in theory, you would think it would be the transitive one. In Nagajona, it's the intransitive. It's the tamidepa. In I, I think it's tamidepa, yeah. And I think that actually, I I looked this up in in Paul's most excellent verb book. This particular spelling goes with a, a, a the Sanskrit also. Uh, mm. the, what do you call that? Um, they don't call it intransitive, but um, anyway, that's what I thought. It's, so, yeah. so the point I'm I'm making is that there are two different. Uh, different spellings of a word that sound similar. When you pronounce them, there's slightly different pronunciation. Like when we say semke, what does semke mean? The mind generation. Mind yeah. generation. In and that k is the is the transitive or intransitive. Uh, that's the transitive. That's the transitive. So you are producing the the mind of enlightenment. Right. Whereas the kewa of production here mm, is, yeah, yeah. is is talking about uh, intransitive, like we would say growth or birth. Uh, so that's something that happens by itself without necessarily an agent. So you have to you have to investigate that a little bit. I, I notice uh, one of my pet peeves. I've got many. <laughs> One of my pet peeves is people that talk about growing the economy. <laughs> so growing should be, used to be uh, a um, intransitive verb, right? Yeah. So the economy grows. You can, you can provide uh, conditions for the economy to grow, but you don't grow the economy. But apparently that's become... Uh, standard fare in the... Can't you grow a seed into a sprout? Do you? Yeah, you, we do say, I, I'm growing corn. Yeah, so that's yeah. a transitive verb. That is... That, oh, I, don't, I think your pet peeve's got to go, Venerable George. No, no, we, there's a different context there. Yeah, you have to think about it a little bit. Uh, when you say, I'm growing corn, that means you're, you've... You've sown the corn in the soil. You've put in some manure at the right season, and you've provided some irrigation. Uh, and so you are allowing the corn to grow. But you are, you know, if you say you're growing the corn, it, it's in that context. So anyway, just just that's just an aside for you uh, linguists among you. So. Uh, any any last irritation before we leave? Any last question? Any clarification you need? Thanks for everyone. Okay, KT's disappearing, I guess. Uh, thanks, KT, for being here. Um, so let's let's dedicate our merits then. Hopefully, we'll see some of you on this coming Monday when we'll have discussion group and we can go into this again and talk about growing corn <laughs> or whatever. Due to these virtues, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha, may I quickly become a Guru Buddha and lead all migrators, all wanderers without exception into that enlightened state. So this is a basic kind of dedication sort of Buddha Chita uh, motivation, thinking uh, by my becoming Buddha, 
due to these merits, may I become a Buddha and as a result of that, lead all living beings without exception into that, that same state. May the supreme precious Bodhicitta that has not arisen, arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase evermore due to the merits that, due to the virtues that I have created today. And then the long life or the, the prayer for the quick return of Lama Zopa Rinpoche's reincarnation. Peerless teacher and assembly of children of the conquerors, Shravakas, Pratika Buddhas, victorious Losan, father and sons, together with your lineages, all objects of refuge of the infinite realms, please now bestow the virtue and goodness to accomplish this prayer. In holding and spreading the Muni's precious and complete teachings through explanation and practice, you, Lama Zopa, wore the armor of patience that is never discouraged. Incomparable, venerable guru, to you I make request. Soul gateway through which all benefit and happiness emerge while striving exclusively both for the welfare of the victorious one's teachings and for mother sentient beings, mother living beings, you suddenly departed to peace. You passed away. At this, I lost hope. Nevertheless, through the undeceiving truths of the oceanic blessings of the triple gem and the great waves of Bodhicitta of the Bodhisattvas, may the smile of a new reincarnation swiftly beam in glory for fortunate disciples. And to all of our primordial gurus, you who are my eyes for viewing all the infinite scriptures, supreme gateway for the fortunate ones traveling to liberation, engaging with skillful means, moved by mercy, illuminating spiritual friends, and the implication is please live long and stable lives. So again, thank you. Uh, I look forward to seeing you next week. And if you have time on Monday, uh, come and debate about transitive and intransitive verbs, about the Samkhya position, and all of these other complicated things. And I think if you read some of these sections in Jeffrey's book and other ones about the debate between Buddha, uh, between Bhava Viveka and Buddha Palita, you should feel some inner proud, inner pride that, wow, I can kind of understand what's being talked about. If I had read this a year ago, six months ago, I would have no idea what it's talking about. Now you can delve into that and uh, use that, uh, those dry bones to gnaw on. Okay. So look forward to seeing you soon. Take care. Thank you very much, Thank Venerable you, George. Thank you. Thank you, Venerable George. Thank you. Thank you.